Welcome to the Commonwealth Matters. I'm Richard Nelson, your host. In less than a week, Kentuckians will go to the polls to elect their next governor. On one side, you have a candidate who often talks about God, quotes scripture, especially the part about loving your neighbor, yet his policy positions don't line up with biblical principles. The other candidate is a Christian who talks about the importance of his relationship with Christ and his policy positions and actions while in office do align with biblical principles. So how's a Christian to vote? Joining us to talk further is former pastor, author, and speaker, Bob Russell. Bob, welcome to the program. Thank you, Richard. Good to be with you. And uh, this is such an important subject. I'm glad to talk about it. Bob, you have uh, talked about this for years, the importance of Christians engaging elections and Christians voting, and not just voting, but voting biblical values. Uh, you recently wrote a column entitled, Christians should, or Christian Voters Should Consider the Spiritual Issues This Election. So can you speak to that, uh, unpack that? What do you mean when you talk about spiritual issues? in this gubernatorial election in particular? Yeah. Well, Jesus said we're to be the salt of the earth and we're to be the light of the world. That means we're not to isolate ourselves from the world, but Christians should be involved in the culture and Christian convictions should dictate how we vote and how we impact the culture. And when it comes to voting, there are some issues that are a matter of opinion and we're, we're free to... Uh, disagree on those issues and vote according to our conscience. But in recent years, there are a number of issues that are really spiritual issues, and they've become political issues. And some people in church will, will say, we well, shouldn't talk about politics from the pulpit, but politics is encroached on, uh, on religion. And yeah. when it comes to the right to life, whether we protect the, the least of these, the unborn, or when it comes to the sanctity of marriage and all the, uh, the, the gender scramble that's being promoted today, uh, when it comes even to uh, issues like uh, religious freedom, uh, does the government have the right to come in and shut down the church? There are a number of issues that are, are not political issues, they are spiritual issues. And just because they begin to bubble up uh, on the ballot, or in, in the discussion that politicians have, that doesn't mean we back off from them. On the contrary, I think we need to be bold and courageous and say, here's what God's word has to say about this, and here's the way uh, a Christian should vote on these issues. Increasingly, uh, pastors are afraid to uh, speak to these issues because they don't want to step on toes. And Bob, in your column, you shared a story about uh, a time when you had preached on the election. It was an election an election weekend sermon on the biblical issues that were at stake, and you urged people to vote as the Lord led. And a couple came up to you afterwards. They were really bothered, and they said that they felt like they had just been to a Republican Party rally. And I sense that there are a lot of pastors today who might fear the same thing happening. What would you say to those pastors who might preach to a large congregation and they don't want to step on toes um, what would you, what would you, how would you counsel them? Well, I have to be careful not to preach for an hour and a half on this subject. <laughs> but I, I, I circulate with preachers a lot and I love preachers. I understand what goes on in the, in, in the parsonage or in the pastor's home and in the pastor's heart. There are two primary reasons that preachers don't want to preach on anything that even smacks of being political. One is that they are advised by some who uh, suggest uh, in some leading evangelical spokespersons that when you talk about anything political, it's going to turn off the millennial. The millennial doesn't want to hear anything about politics when he or she comes to church. And so if you talk about anything political, they're going to turn you off. They may never come back. And to some degree, that's true. Uh, however, uh, our primary calling is not to look at life through the lens of the seeker. We yeah. first look at life through the lens of God's Word. What does God call us to do first? And so even if it causes some to be disturbed, I think we have an obligation, uh, in the words of the Apostle Paul, to preach the whole counsel of God. The second reason that preachers don't want to speak about anything political is when they do, they do get considerable criticism. Yeah. I, I don't know whether you've noticed, 
but the people who are more liberal in their persuasion are usually much more vocal. Yeah. And if you have people sitting in the congregation who lean a little bit left, when they hear something that is contrary and makes them feel uncomfortable, yeah. they are not going to remain silent. They are going to uh, uh, state their objection. And I did. I, years ago, there was a, uh, an election coming up, and there were several issues that had to do with uh, spiritual matters. And I said, here are the issues in this election. Here's what the Bible has to say. Here's the way I think uh, God would have us vote. I didn't mention the word Republican. I didn't mention the independent. I didn't mention Democrat. But I, I, I got a reaction from a couple who said, we don't think we're going to come back because uh, it sounded like we were at a Republican rally. Yeah. Now, the problem there is, the problem there is people's allegiance to a party is stronger than their allegiance to yeah. Jesus Christ and stronger to their, than their allegiance to God's word. Now, but no preacher likes to hear that. Uh, we can get 20 compliments and get one criticism, and the critical voice, the, the loud objection, is the one that makes us back off. Yeah. I would say one more thing about that to preachers. God has called us to be a pastor, to be a shepherd of the flock. Yeah. And a shepherd feeds his flock, a shepherd loves his flock, sends his flock, but the shepherd is to guide his flock. Yeah. And, and uh, sheep don't always know where they're supposed to go. And if, if, we, if we love the sheep and we love the country and we, we love our children and our grandchildren and we care about the future, how can we remain silent when these issues are going to impact uh, the well-being and the very stability and maybe the existence of our country in the future? Bob, that's well said. Uh, the role of a pastor isn't to placate people or to not to offend people or to avoid difficult topics, but it is to pastor, to shepherd, to disciple, to help their people to think biblically about the issues. I want to go back to something you said earlier, that uh, these issues are really spiritual issues. When you think about marriage, um, this wasn't the government's idea, but it's God's idea. It's very clear in Genesis chapter one that God made them male and female and brought them together to become one flesh. Uh, the gender identity issue. Uh, God came up with the idea of male and female to begin with. Uh, again, Genesis chapter one. And when you have people confused about gender or what it means to be male or female, don't you think that it's the church and pastors who should speak to this and have the authority to speak to this more than any other uh, group of people in society, including politicians? I mean, to me, it seems that God gives us his rules for life, his guidebook for life, the truth of who we are and how we ought to live. And these issues are in the forefront, uh, life, uh, the sanctity of life. God made us in his image. This is what makes human life so precious and so valuable. All three of these issues that I just mentioned are in the very first book of the Bible, and yet pastors are uh, pushing it to the side. How would you approach those pastors again? I know I'm pressing in, you, have, you just touched on this, but how can we get pastors convinced? And there are some, look, pastors have a tough job. They're in a, we're in a very difficult climate. But for those pastors who are still not convinced that they should speak to any one of those issues as it relates to an election, um, what else, what further could we say? You know, you read in the Old Testament about the men of Issachar, understood the times, and knew what Israel should do. Mm -hmm. It is really the task of a spiritual leader to be perceptive enough to understand the times in which we live. The men yeah. of Issachar were living in a time when the followers of King Saul were battling against the followers of young David, and they couldn't determine who was going to be the king. But the men of Issachar understood where the future was going, and they said, it is God's will that David become king, and they got behind him. And it's a job of the spiritual leader to, to be perceptive about what God's will is for the future and to lead people to speak. If, if we can't speak out about issues about life and about marriage and about uh, the very uh, moral values of our children being taught in school, what in the world are we going to speak out about? That's right. Well, the, it, the Bible over and over again says, you be strong, you be courageous. And, and it's not our job to put our finger up to the wind and see which way the wind's blowing or who's going to object. Lao Shallard used to talk about two kinds of churches. He said there are second commandment churches and there are first commandment churches. 
Hmm. The Second Commandment Church is a church that takes the Second Commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, and tries to interpret what's going to be the most loving thing to do. The First Commandment is to love God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And the first question should be, what does God's Word say about this? Yeah. And I, I try to point out to, to preachers, we got to understand the times and make a difference in where the country is going. Uh, the Old Testament prophets uh, spoke truth to power to the point where King Ahab said to Elijah, is that you, my enemy? <laughs> and Elijah didn't say, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you, King. I'm, I'm just out here trying to be nice to everybody. Uh, he, he stood for truth. And John the Baptist spoke out about King Herod living with his uh his brother Philip's wife he says not right. He got him put in prison, and John didn't apologize and say I'm sorry, King. I shouldn't have spoken about that. He, he, Jesus said no greater man born to woman than John the Baptist. And sometimes people say, well, you know, Jesus didn't speak about anything political. Uh, N.T. Wright points out that Jesus spoke often against the Pharisees, and it's wrong to say, well, the Pharisees were the religious leaders of that day. They're the church leaders. N.T. Wright points out the 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 Pharisees and the Sanhedrin had the power to arrest and imprison and punishment. They didn't have a, uh, the power to, to kill, uh, capital punishment, but they didn't just have religious power. They had uh, political power, and Jesus often spoke against them. You know, uh, Eric Metaxas has written that book, uh, A Letter to the American Church. And he points out, having done all the study about Bonhoeffer for that book, he points out that so many pastors in Germany in the 30s didn't want to be political. And they thought, if we just lay low, if we just don't agitate Hitler, if we just don't alienate people by being political, eventually things will turn around and we'll get back to where we were before. But they didn't understand the times. They didn't understand what they should do. And as a result of their lack of leadership, Germany was lost and millions of people were killed. And I just think preachers have got to understand the times today and, and know we've got to speak up. And I'll tell you what, this coming election is, is so stark in the contrast between the two people who are running. And if we, if we can't see it here uh, and we can't lead our people here, then uh, I, I think God's going to wipe his hands and say, uh, you, you have no courage. Uh, be bold, be courageous, and, and, and stand for truth. Are you going to alienate some people? Yeah, so did Jesus, so did the disciples. But we have an obligation to speak the truth in love. I'm sorry I'm on a soapbox about this, nope. but uh, it, 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 I'm telling you what, if the church and the leaders of the church in the next week would begin to speak up and take a stand, uh, there's a possibility we can turn this around. If you like what's going on in the government and all the woke philosophy and all the gender di this, uh, confusion and the so lean towards socialism and open borders, then this vote for the way we've always voted. But if you, in private, you, you say you care and you can see what's going on, then be strong and courageous and lead your people. Be, be a shepherd of the flock. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to the Commonwealth Matters. I'm Richard Nelson with Bob Russell, and we are talking about the upcoming gubernatorial election. Early voting starts on November the 2nd. It goes through November the 4th, and election day is November the 7th. Uh, Bob, you were alluding to the big difference between the two candidates for governor here in Kentucky. Uh, I'm, I'm going to name names. I'm just going to put it out there. and. I want to just add a little caveat or a footnote, if I could, that I'm careful when I talk about somebody's faith. Um, somebody might have a, a maybe be a, a baby believer or not very mature in their faith. So I want to be careful when I talk about uh, that person. However, when somebody talks about their faith in public, and especially if it's a political candidate, they open themselves up to a different level of scrutiny. And specifically, uh, Governor Andy Bashir identifies as a Christian. In fact, he is a deacon in his church. Uh, he likes to quote scripture. I've listened to him in person a number of times, quoting scripture, talking about God and what God would have us to do, and especially loving our neighbor as ourselves. However, when I look at scripture and see what scripture says about these core issues, life, marriage, religious freedom, gender, uh, all of these issues, I do not see it lining up with 
biblical principles when I compare it to Andy Bashir's positions and what he's done while governor. On the other hand, we have Daniel Cameron, who is the attorney general, and Daniel has shared about his faith and his relationship with Christ. I've heard him in person a number of times. His actions and his policy positions do line up with scripture. Now, Bob, let's be frank. There are a lot of Kentuckians who identify as Christian, but they just don't know their Bible very well. Uh, they might be confused. They have two candidates running for governor who identify as Christian, and they're not sure how to think about these issues. Can you speak to that? Well, I am not anybody's judge of who spends eternity where. Uh, that's God's prerogative, and he's the lone judge. Mm -hmm. However, his word says, by their fruit, you will know them. Yeah. Somebody said, I'm not a judge, but I'm a fruit inspector. <laughs> So when it comes time to make a decision about who I'm going to vote for to, to lead our commonwealth, I'm going to look at the fruit. I'm going yeah. to look at the results. I'm going to remember what has been done in the past. I am not going to forget when I go to the polls, this one guy shut down the church on Easter Sunday, not only shut down the church, but sent uh, state police into the parking lot of a church yeah. that refused to shut down, yeah. took down license numbers in order to threaten. Now, that is so contrary to the, uh, our, 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 the Bill of Rights and our right for religious freedom. And uh, something's wrong when you tr try to shut down the church and you keep abortion clinics open and liquor stores open. Yeah. And, and by their fruit, you will know them. This same guy says that he's a Christian, but he is for the killing of the unborn. Right yeah. up to, uh, he will only take a stand uh, against uh, a partial birth abortion. Yeah. And uh, he he won't take a stand against the mutilation of young children in yeah. the gender dysphoria situations yeah. and the rights of parents to make a decision. And, you know, I got a letter from somebody when I wrote the blog and I said, I'm, I'm going to endorse Daniel Cameron. Somebody said, well, I think uh, you, these issues matter, but character matters, too. Well. Yeah. What, 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 how do you determine the character of a person by what he says or what he does? That's right. What is the character of a person who is, who is for the killing of the unborn? Jesus said, uh, the same as you do it to the least of these, you do it to me. And you yeah. don't get any, any more vulnerable and uh, unprotected than the unborn. And if Christian people can't stand uh, up for the, the unborn, uh, I just question the depth of our own commitment to Jesus Christ. Bob, I couldn't agree with you more on that. I'll add one other thing, and then I want to unpack it. And it's when uh, Governor Bashir was in office for maybe a couple of months, and there was a gay rights rally in the Capitol Rotunda. After that rally, there were a group of drag queens who took a picture with the governor. It was the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. They mock the Christian faith. And uh, he took a picture with them and he was asked sometime after, would you do that picture again? He said, yes, I would. Uh, now, he says that this is loving his neighbor. He is saying that he wants to include all people in Kentucky into his uh, policy programs and in his agenda. And one thing I would like to add is that it's one thing to love people. I don't have to agree with them. I think that we should love people, even our enemies. This is what Christ tells us. But it's a uh, there's a difference when you make it a policy to certainly to elevate something that is immoral or something that con is contrary to Scripture. And I think that is what we're seeing. That's what you just said when it comes to gender ideology, especially with their young people, the gender ideology being promoted in our public schools, the idea that minors should be able to determine their own gender and even pursue hormone therapy or sex transition surgeries. It's one thing to love people on a personal level and to try to help them see the truth and walk with them in their time of difficulty. It's another when you take a policy position that's actually harmful, that is actually immoral. And I think, I think that's what we're getting down to here. And in my lifetime, Bob, I have not seen a more far left political leader in the Commonwealth. As nice as Andy Bashir may be, I think he does have, he is a kind person. He does have a lot of empathy for people. When it comes down to his policy positions, I have not seen a more far left um, anti-biblical, and I don't think that's saying it too strongly, 
uh, leadership in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. You know, the, the Bible says we're to love that which is good, but we're to hate, hate that which is evil. Yeah. And if you love your child, if you've got a toddler, three or four year old child, mm-hmm. and you've got a, a wild, drunken teenager driving 60 miles an hour down your street time and time again, your, your responsibility is not just to love that neighbor boy. You're going to go out in the street and you're going to stop that car or you're going to talk to his parents and say, you are endangering the life of my child. And I, I, you, you hate the way that, that uh, teenager is driving. It's not good for your child. It's not good for him. And you're going to speak out against it. And no matter, he might be a charmer. His parents might be as nice as they can be, but there's a behavior that you despise. If you love yeah. your child, you hate leukemia. And if you love God, you're going to hate evil. And how, how can you not hate the uh, uh, when a, a drag queen is trying to sexualize a, a little child? And, yeah. you know, I, it, just, it galls me to see the parents and adults standing on the sidelines while this is going on and clapping like seals as to, as to what's going on. And, and there, there's there's something wrong with the love they have for their children, or they're very, very naive about uh, the end result of that behavior. Yeah. Bob, you brought up Dietrich Bonhoeffer and used the analogy of a teenager driving uh, in a dangerous manner. Bonhoeffer reflected on what was happening in Nazi Germany under Hitler. He started out as a pacifist. He didn't think that Christians should be involved with the war. He really didn't find his voice to speak against the Nazi party or Hitler in particular until later on, until he really saw the atrocities. And Bonhoeffer said something to this effect. If I see a madman behind the wheel of a car, do I not have a duty to get that steering wheel from him so he doesn't hurt other people? And this is in a similar vein where we have, uh, we're talking about the highest elected position in Kentucky where the, uh, the, the policy positions, the actions, uh, the executive orders, these affect real people. And the policy positions of Andy Bashir have been very harmful when it comes to specific things, certainly harmful to the unborn, who he has not afforded legal protections in the law. It's certainly not to that gender dysphoric minor who needs an adult to say, no, you are a male or you are female, and we will walk with you through your gender dysphoria, but we will not allow you to change your own uh, own gender. Uh, The policy positions of this governor are disastrous. And I think of myself as a pretty measured person, but I have become very, very passionate in this election just because as we're talking about the, the issues are important, There is a stark difference between the candidates, and there is so much at stake. The leadership of Kentucky for the next four years is at stake. Um, Go ahead. You know, years ago, we remained silent as our universities became increasingly liberal. And now, with the issue going on, Hamas has a horrendous attack on Israel. And from our universities comes all this uh, woke philosophy and standing for the Palestinians and the rallies of the kids on campus. We see the end result of the, yeah. the liberalism that encroached on the college campus and, and the, the policies that are anti-biblical, anti-Christ have long-term serious consequences to the future of, of this nation. And I, I'm a, I think we have a chance to to put somebody in the governor's position, uh, in, in the governor's office, the, uh, like Daniel Cameron, who who will stand for biblical truth. But I don't think we're I don't think he's going to win if if Christian people don't wake up, if if pastors don't begin to speak up and don't understand the times in which we live. I I think the times are are crucial. The times are short, and we need pastors who would take the responsibility of being shepherds a lot more seriously than they have in the past. Bob, pastors will have one more Sunday before the election. What would you say to them? Maybe they don't have a election day sermon prepared, but what would be your word of advice? There's two things here. What would be your word of advice to them specifically if they don't have a whole sermon on it? Number one. Number two, is there a political line that pastors should not cross in the pulpit? Well, I don't. I think 
we hailed Bonhoeffer as a hero because he reached the point where he understood the times and he came out strongly against Hitler. Yeah. And there, there is an understanding of the time when we say, uh, and, and in, in the Revolutionary War, there were a number of pastors in, in the frontier that took a strong stand. And as a result, we became free from England. So I, I think they're going to have to follow their own conscience, but allow the Bible to be their guide. Yeah. You guys have a, a, a great uh, uh, paper that shows the contrast on spiritual values between yeah. the two. Well, then go to my blog, uh, bobrussell.org, and look at three, four weeks ago, which I reposted uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the information from the Commonwealth Policy Center. Yeah. And you, you don't have to... to even say um, this is a Republican platform or this is a Democratic platform. Just say here are the issues, right? And, and here's here's where the two candidates stand. And to say we we've, we've got to understand the times and Christian people to be the salt of the earth. And are you going to be criticized? Yes, but uh, I, I, you're going to have to face your kids someday and yeah. your grandkids someday, and they're going to ask, "What in the world were you doing when, when we let this country fall apart?" More importantly, you're going to face God someday. And he's going to ask, uh, why didn't you speak up? And you're going to, you want to say, well, I was afraid of being criticized. I didn't want to say anything political. Uh, I think he's going to, he's going to say, uh, you had a responsibility. Uh, not many of you should be teachers because you're going to be judged more harshly. And we have an awesome responsibility to shepherd our flock. And I would just encourage you, let's take advantage of this next, next weekend and speak up and outline for our people uh, what the issues are and encourage them to vote according to biblical values. And Bob, as you mentioned, the Commonwealth Policy Center has election resources. You can go to our website, commonwealthpolicycenter.org, and you can find where the candidates stand on the issues. I encourage pastors, please check that out and uh, speak to these issues, uh, even from the pulpit. Uh, what I was alluding to, as far as a line that a pastor shouldn't cross, I would say that um, pastors should not be co-opted by any political party. I think the pastor's role and a church's role uh, should be to speak to the issues, to disciple their congregations, speak very clearly what God's word says on these things. But uh, the church should not be a, a, a political gathering, if you will, or a, a place where a, a political party would come in and use the church, if you will. But I think that the church, and I think you'll agree with me, Pastors should never be afraid to speak to the yeah, issues. That's probably a better answer than the one I gave. No, no, <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I'm just but putting I, a finer am, point on I, it, brother. <laughs> I, I don't think we ought to have a Trump sign outside the church and uh, have a Republican rally at all. But I do think the issues are so yeah. clear, I, I don't understand how somebody uh, cannot see what the issues are. Agreed. I agree 100% with that. That is a good word. Um, Bob, with uh, we've got just a just a, a minute here for that Christian who might not have been politically engaged in the past. Maybe they only vote during presidential elections, uh, and they don't really understand a lot. But they are concerned about these issues. They do want to vote biblical values. Um, what would be your word of encouragement to them this particular election? And here's the context: uh, only about one out of three every registered Kentucky voter will vote in a gubernatorial election year. It's a very low number compared to presidential election years. So uh, what would you say to that um, believer who might not be particularly politically engaged? Well, we have a responsibility as Christians to, to impact our culture, to, to make a difference, to be the salt of the earth. So make up your mind you're going to vote, even though it may not be convenient for you. And secondly, you pray about how you should vote and look at the issues and vote intelligently. But then take somebody with you. Call some yeah. of your neighbors. Call, talk to some of the people in the church and, and get enthusiastic about the, the country in which we live. I'll have preachers say to me, well, you know, the Apostle Paul, he, he never said the ought to up, uh, uh, uproot Caesar. Well, Paul lived under a tyrannical government. Our government is a republic. A constitutional republic. We are the government. It's the government of the people. And we have a responsibility to be stewards of what God has entrusted to us because mm -hmm. we're a part of that government. So I'd encourage 
you vote, you pray about how you're going to vote, you get somebody, uh, encourage some others to do the same, and maybe we can make a difference uh, this coming week. Bob Russell, that is a good final word. Thank you so much for joining me on the Commonwealth Matters. God bless you and you keep up the good work. And if you enjoyed this program, uh, please like us on whatever podcast platform you listen to and also tell your friends about us. Encourage them to subscribe to the Commonwealth Matters. Thank you and God bless you.